Hi, my name is Pastor Hal York, and welcome to Truth in the Trenches. Today we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 12. One would think in reading Proverbs that the lowest rung on the ladder of human depravity or hopelessness one could sink to will be labeled a fool. But the verse we want to look at today says that as far as having any hope of rescue, there's one rung lower than the fool. That no one is beyond rescue. No one is beyond rescue. No one is ever beyond the saving power of the gospel. But who would this person be lower than the fool? Is it, the, is it a pimp? Is it a warlord? Is it a drug dealer? Is it a sex trafficker? Is it a serial killer? No. Proverbs 26, 12 says, Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. I mean, that's quite a statement. There are many things that are depraved, sinful acts and attitudes men can have. Lists, and there's lists in the New Testament setting forth the works of the flesh. And these are, they, obviously, they're all sin. They're all wicked. They're all, all a part of the depraved heart. Romans 1, Galatians 5, 1 Corinthians 6, we see some of these lists. But the point I want to consider here, and I think this verse drives home, is a very important one. Satan's goal in our life is not to make us unrighteous, but self-righteous. Think about that statement. Satan's goal is not to make us unrighteous, but self-righteous. Satan wants to make us good. He will allow us to define that goodness any way we choose. Don't worry about what God says. He says, listen to me. But our verse says there's more hope for a fool than a self-righteous person, one wise in his own eyes. Just think about our culture and then think about what this verse is saying. Our culture has turned the, the ladder upside down. In modern society, to be wise in our own eyes is the highest rung in the ladder, not the lowest. We live in a world where everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes and feeling perfectly justified in doing so. Don't you dare say otherwise or you will incur the wrath of a self-righteous, self-justifying, self-loving culture. It has a form of godliness, but they deny the power. It is a self-made godliness, a self-defined godliness, a self-motivated godliness, and a self-exalting godliness. And to accomplish this, man had to redefine and reshape God in his own image, which he's been doing since sin entered the human race through the sin of Adam. But not only that, he's had to redefine and reshape the gospel into a self-improvement message. And sadly, some of the fastest growing and largest churches in North America are churches that are doing just that. Satan wants to corrupt what God says is good. Satan wants to complicate what God says is simple. Satan wants to confuse what God says is clear. And Satan wants to commend what God says is sin. And self-righteousness, pride, is at the top of the list. Satan's sin that got him kicked out of heaven was, I will be like the Most High. And when he came and tempted Eve, he says, you will be like God if you eat this apple or eat this fruit, forbidden fruit. There's no greater barrier to the gospel than self-righteousness. One writer has said, many, are they, many there are who are good and righteous, but only in their own conceit and esteem, not truly so. They place their righteousness in outward things and the observance of external duties. And though there may be some little imperfection in them, yet they think or have imagined that they have arrived to perfection. And such are generally conceited, proud, and haughty, and despise others. All which flows from ignorance. For though they fancy themselves to be wise, they are very ignorant of themselves and of the plague of their own hearts, of the law of God and the spirituality of it and the extensiveness of its demands of the strict justice and righteousness of God which will not admit an imperfect righteousness. There is more hope of a fool than for this person. More hope for a wicked sinner than a self-righteous person. For Christ came to call sinners, not the righteous, not the sad or the lonely or the misguided or those with low self-esteem. No, he came to call sinners to repentance, and he receives them as sinners. Therefore, we must see ourselves as such before there can ever be salvation. The writer goes on. He says, Humanly speaking, there is a greater likelihood and greater hope of convincing sinners and bringing them to repentance and to forsake their sins than there is of convincing a self righteous person of the insufficiency of his righteousness and the folly of trusting in it and bringing him to repent of such confidence and to forsake it. For it is very natural to him, it's his own. It's the effect of great labor and great pains and encourages self love and boasting, Look what I've done. But if he turns to Christ and calls himself a sinner, 
all that goes out the window. That's from John Gill, a, pur a Puritan. There's lots to think about in those two paragraphs. Christ came to save his people from their sin, to call sinners to repentance. He calls sinners to trust in his work on the cross. He bore our sins on the cross, suffered our death. Our sins were laid on him. All our righteousness is, he counted as filthy rags, it says. And the merits of Christ's righteousness were given to us, to the, all those who trust in Christ. It's by grace alone he forgives, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Word of God, the Spirit of God, convict men of sin. And nothing we can do can merit salvation. We're lost without hope. We need a righteousness that is not our own. Martin, Martin Luther called it a foreign righteousness, and one that has been provided for us. The righteousness of Christ. Imputed to us as a gift given by God, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You think of the prodigal. The gospel is, when it comes to the prodigal sitting in the pigsty eating pig food, it's not hard to convince them of their sinfulness, that they need a savior. It's the prodigal's brother that I think we see as the self-righteous. The apostle Paul, I think, calls himself the chief of sinners because if you look at when he got saved in Acts chapter 9 and he talks about himself in, in Philippians chapter 3, you could see that here was a man who was oozing was self-righteousness. It was coming out of his pores. He thought he was a very godly, righteous person. But when he came to know Christ, it says in Philippians 3, that he counted all of his own righteousness as dung, as garbage, that he might be found clothed in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. Only the pure and unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ can work that change in a man's heart. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. There's no greater barrier to the gospel than self-righteousness, the pride of self-righteousness. What men will not let go of is their own self-righteousness. And they go to hell clinging to that. But the offer of salvation is for all those who will admit that their self-righteousness is just garbage. It's nothing. It's sin. It's pride. And come to the cross and fall on the cross of Jesus Christ to find forgiveness from sin, and be clothed in his perfect righteousness. And that is a gift God offers to all who will bow their knee and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we will be saved. No merit of my own is anger to suppress. My only hope is Jesus' blood and righteousness. May this truth guide us and guard us in the trenches of life as we seek to live for the glory of God and the good of others. May God bless.